Okay, so let's just do the four limitless contemplations. Thank you. Very important that you say these every day because they say everything about bodhicitta, about your open heart, your loving kindness, your compassion, your equanimity, everything. May all beings have happiness and create the causes of happiness. May they all be free from suffering and creating the causes of suffering. May they find that noble happiness which can never be tainted by suffering. May they attain universal impartial compassion free of worldly bias towards friends and enemies. So good evening, everybody. I know Mark, you are Avril's friend. Welcome, butt in if you need anything or you don't understand anything. With pleasure, just butt in, okay? Don't worry and ask. Whatever you don't understand, we're very patient in this group. We take, we help everybody when they come in first. So tonight, we're going to do the second part of um, called Forgetfulness, the double-sided coin for life in samsara. So if you weren't there last week, then try and at least get that recording so that you can really know what's going on, because I'm not going to go over much, because there's really a lot of teaching in this. And then we'll continue with this next week. And then we'll close for the month of August. So um, so let's really yeah. now get some teaching butt in if you need to, if you need anything. Yeah. So last week we were talk, we were talking on an enormous story of forgetfulness, where the venerable Chinese mother had to send Buddhas to the earth plane to wake us up because we'd forgotten who we are. And then we, uh, you know, we'd forgotten something that would change every single, every single thing in our lives, okay? So we've forgotten the ground of our being, who we really are. And that makes us honestly, honestly vulnerable to everything in samsara. And so we really, really, really need right. to remember that, which is so important. And what we need to forget, it's choking my dog, what we need to forget is a lot of the things we are solidly attaching to. We attach to everything in samsara and those things we really need to do some forgetting and forget about some of the things that we always hang on to about our roles and about everything in our lives. So I'm going to start with a little story of an American tourist found himself in India on the day of the pilgrimage to the top of a sacred mountain. Thousands of people would climb the steep path to the mountain top. The tourist who'd been jogging and doing vigorous exercise and thought he was in good shape, trust the Americans, okay, he thought he was in good shape, decided to join in and share the experience. After 20 minutes, he was out of breath and he could hardly climb another step. While women carrying babies and frail old men with canes moved easily past him. I don't understand it, he said to an Indian companion. How can those people do it when I can't? His friends answered, it's because you have the typical American habit of seeing everything as a test. You see the mountain as your enemy and you set out to defeat it. So naturally, the mountain fights back, and it's stronger than you are. We do not see the mountain as our enemy to be conquered. The purpose of our clan is for our inner being to be in harmony with the mountain, to become one with the mountain, and so it lifts us up and carries us along. Now, if we took this seriously in our lives, it would help a tremendous amount 
because we always struggling for success, struggling to be accepted, struggling to show our identity, struggling for absolutely everything, for all the plans. And maybe when we just go back and unite to the ground of our being, it actually is the way the oneness takes us along in a beautiful, in a beautiful way. And what should we use to dissolve all the obstacles in our lives? We can either have an external solution or we can remember who we are. Those, those are the two things. So that's my one story. And my other story, which I have told before, but they're too, they're too relevant not to tell them again. So sorry if you heard the story before. One great master in the last century had a disciple who was a little bit thick-headed. The master had taught him again and again, trying to introduce him to the nature of his true mind. Still, he could not get it. Finally, the master became a bit impatient and told him, look, I want you to carry this bag full of barley up to the mountain over there, but you mustn't stop and rest. Just keep going until you reach the top. The disciple was a simple man, but he had unshakable devotion and trust in his master, and he did exactly what had been told. The bag was heavy. He picked it up and started up the slope of the mountain, not daring to stop. He just walked and walked and the bag got heavier and heavier. It took him a long time. At last, when he reached the top, he dropped the bag. He slumped to the ground, overcome with exhaustion, but deeply relaxed. He felt the fresh mountain air on his face. All his resistance had dissolved. And with it, his ordinary mind. And everything just seemed to stop. At that instant, he suddenly realized the nature of mind, of his mind. Ah, oh, he shouted. This is what my master has been showing me all along, he thought. He ran down back down the mountain and against all convention, burst into his master's room. I think I've got it now. I've really got it. His master smiled at him knowingly. So you had an interesting climb up the mountain, did you? Now that story is also a very, very important thing because mostly we are carrying burdens up the mountain. Okay, we've got so many problems and so many difficulties and so many heavy burdens, we forget that the solution is inside and it's really, really important. Sometimes when you stop the intellectual effort, the analyzing, the judging, when you suddenly surrender to the problem, okay? When you surrender, we suddenly get it. The solution is there before the, before the problem ever came about, but we can't see it. Because we use the ordinary mind to completely and totally analyze and analyze and analyze. And I remember this very clearly because when I was in India, I was doing the Zogchen preliminary practices. And in them, you had to act out all the realms. But you're supposed to do it out in the open by a mountain where nobody is so you can scream and you can shout and you can do everything. So you act out the hell realms, the hungry ghost realms, you act out all the different realms. And it really is exhausting because I used to take, you know, a whole long period of time to act out the hell realms. So first I was in the cold realms and you're shivering and you really believe everything's in your hell mind. And then you're in the hot realms and you're burning and you're screaming. And at the end of it, you go to something called Nidua, which is when you just collapse on the floor like that disciple did and in that moment when you've let go of everything when you've let be of everything you suddenly realize oh my there's much 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 more in the world ready for me waiting for me I just haven't seen it I haven't got it I haven't done it you know that's that's when we change the whole focus of our lives from unawareness 
forgetting, we're going to talk about unaware, not remembering and being distracted. If you just watch your mind at work in one single day, you'll see how distracted you are. When this one calls you, that one calls you, the phone rings, your mind goes, you're thinking about this, you're working everything out. It's distraction all the time. We have to go from that unawareness and forgetting and distraction to intrinsic awareness. And we're going to learn this in these two days. What is intrinsic awareness and how do I get there? It's very, very, very important. You know, Tuku Urjan Rinpoche says, natural mindfulness, and when, we, when he talks about mindfulness, he's talking about it in the real Buddhist way, not about these mindful movements that are all around in the world at the moment, because a lot of them have got focuses on the negative emotions and then letting them dissolve. And this actual, what he says is, the natural mindfulness, or he gives another description, the unfabricated mindfulness. Remember that word, unfabricated. It means it's not made up of millions of different causes and effects. It's just natural when you just let everything be in that moment. He says unfabricated mindfulness simply means not forgetting. The moment you forget, you have no presence of mind. You're distracted. You're all over the place. And you're in your human part of your mind. The human part is called SEM, S-E-M-S -S in Tibetan. And the natural part is called SEM NI or RIGPA. And we're going to learn in these next two sessions to really differentiate. It's not that they're different. It's just that SEM is one grain of sand in the full sand pit. And Rikpa or Semni is everything that we actually have. So it's really important. So I just want to take a couple of things. I just happened to be listening to a beautiful tape that Tupton gave at our center. A few of you might, might remember the talk, but there were really some very important points here. He said, the three things to, to practice awareness are focus first on something. So if you want to focus on the breath, that's fine. If you don't like the breathing, you can focus on something else. It doesn't really matter. You can have a little Buddha picture. You could even have a stone, but it's much easier to just focus on the breath, to bring the energy into the central channel. Very important. The second point is the focus. The second point is to start noticing where the mind goes. And I said these three things last time, but to notice where the mind is going. Because when you're distracted, you do not notice how your mind jumps around all the time. When you are focused, you see where your mind goes. And the third thing is return to the focus. So focus, notice, Return to the focus, which is really, really very important, okay? it's And that's how we start with that awareness. And Tupton gave this lovely example. He said, a large part of our lives in the West is about waiting. He says, we're waiting for a program. We're waiting for a match. We're waiting for a play. We're waiting for a broadcast. We're waiting in a queue. We're at the bank, we're waiting. We're at the supermarket, we're waiting. In a traffic jam, we're waiting for the robot to change. We're waiting to vote. We're waiting for a message. We're waiting for a plane, a train, a bus, a friend to be served in a restaurant, to fetch someone. We're waiting for a download on the computer, a reply, an update. Now he says, all these waiting moments sometimes longer, can be seen as the moment or two to practice this awareness. You bring the mind back from distraction all over the place to focus awareness and awareness that the ground of our being is our natural state, which is really, really important. And that's how we get to awaken the nature of mind, which is pristine awareness. Now think of ourselves when we're waiting, when you're in quite a hurry, you're waiting for a robot to change. 
instead of going, I'm so aggravated, look at the time, it's getting late. Instead of doing that, you just think a moment of waiting. Focus, notice, return to the focus, do those three things. And use every moment when you've got to wait to, to, to really focus and bring yourself back to awareness. And he spoke about the difference between Western psychology and Buddhism. So, the, so somebody in the group asked a question. She said, um, I get very impatient and very aggravated whenever I wait. So now I've just done a course in mindfulness. And she said, what I was taught to do was to focus on my aggravation until it dissolves. So what he answered, he said, Western psychology focuses on content, where Buddhism, Buddhism focuses on the nature of mind. Big difference, okay? Because one focuses on the content and one focuses on the nature of mind. And he said, lots of the mindfulness teachings <clears throat> that are in the world at the moment in the West focus on that feeling of aggravation, then dissolve it, and then, you know, look at it and then dissolve it. But he says, Buddhism goes straight back to the mind. Okay, the ground out of which that aggravation came. You have a ground and your aggravation and all your emotional feelings come out of that ground. So when you go back to the mind and we're going to look at the mirror of the mind, you are looking at something different because you are looking at what part of you what part of you is reflecting this aggravation, this anger, this impatience, whatever it is that we are looking at? You're rather looking at the mind. So it's like if you take a mirror and you go, oh, there's there's a phone, you know, there's a there's a, a a wet mist on the mirror. So if you look at that, what you're seeing in your aggravation is a wet mist. So come back to the mind to clean it so that it can focus something very, very, very different, which is what we're doing, what we're trying to do. And he said, when you do that, you get a different view. It's not that we are never, ever focusing on or examining emotions, but we focus much more on the ground or essence rather than emphasizing the thought or feeling. We're aware we irritated with waiting, but we focus on the mirror, on the true essence, which is really important. Now, it's interesting because James Lowe gave another example, which I thought was really good. He said, if you take a cup, okay, let's say this is a cup. If you take a cup and as the basis, and then you fill it with tea, coffee, orange juice, and what happens to us in the West is, we focus on, mmm, this is delicious tea. Mmm, this is nice coffee, whatever the case is. We never look at the base of what is in the cup as the basis. And he says, further trouble, if you pour orange juice into the cup and there's already a bit of coffee, you're in trouble. He says, but we never stop pouring all our rubbish emotions, mixing them all together, you know. Then we're aggravated about this, we're impatient about this, we're angry about this, whatever we are. And he says, and then we concentrate on the confusion of what is in the cup instead of going back to the cup, the base, the nature of your mind. And the nature of your mind is what we need to be constantly aware of as there's no suffering, no stains, no accusations, no self-pity, or any marks of our Western approach there. No substance, no solidity, no permanence to the emotions. Now, what do you think of it? We're going to do tonight a lot of how we actually do it. It's all very well to say do it, but how do we do it? But maybe anybody wants to ask or say, at this point. I'm happy. Yes, please, Esti. Um, it's very difficult not to think of the content. Okay. If, you, if you're sitting in your car 
and you're waiting for the traffic light, we don't call it robot here, we call it traffic light okay. to change. Sure. And you are aggravated because you may be late. So you stop and you say, okay, I'm aggravated. Why am I aggravated? Because I think I'm going to be late. Well, how, how do you do it? How you, do you do it the Eastern way? Yeah. You see, you see, what you're looking at is how we, we have a particular set belief about life. You know, I've been listening to so many things on how we compound and confuse our belief system. Because we believe, how many things did you believe in growing up and getting older that you now don't believe in? How many times do we take a belief system and really look at it? Now, when you look at that aggravation, okay, you really want to see that aggravation because basically that aggravation is because our whole lives is about the, the waiting, the, the being in time for an appointment, the next appointment, the next thought, the next emotion. You know, that's how our whole lives operate. Now, the way you do it, and I'm going to give you a lot of techniques tonight from Shamata to be passionate, but the way you do it is you keep remembering that there's a whole being of you that is not even affected. I mean, when you really think about it, does the aggravation help you to be earlier for the appointment? Okay, does it? No. Does it help your blood pressure? No. Does it actually help anything? Not at all. So why do we do it? It's like people say to me, you know, I can't help it. I, 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 I love that drug ecstasy. It makes me feel wonderful. I love taking, you know, I love taking cocaine. It gives me into a lovely shot. I love a glass of whiskey. It makes me feel amazing. You know, lots of people say that kind of thing. It's the same habit. It's just a habit momentum. So what you're training is, as soon as the aggravation is there, you notice it and return to the base. It's not that you don't know it's there. You know you're going to be late and you know there's a certain amount of aggravation, but you're taking the focus from that into who you are. Like this is a wonderful moment for me to practice my intrinsic awareness and practice. And by the time the robot goes re green or the traffic light goes green, you quite you you wish it would have stayed red a bit longer, even if you are going to be late. You late, you late. You know it's really important. It's looking at the mirror of the mind rather than the content of what is reflected. Clean the mirror, not the reflections, because five minutes later there's another reflection. Do you know what I'm trying to say? It's very important. Yeah, I get it. Thank okay. you. Okay, I just want to give you this text that I wrote down from a retreat of mine. It was from the Tantra Heap of Jewels. It says, when people with deviant view, their minds controlled by externals, that's what we're talking about, see the door of irrefutable truth, their entire fixated Mountain of belief collapses. Now, don't we want to collapse a few of our belief systems? Because what we believe is quite tragic and quite painful and quite awful. Okay. And it's really, really important to that we that we stop this. Because another part of that same sutra said this magnificent tantra said this magnificent release in the here and now is not like gaining freedom from material chains. Now, when I saw that, I thought, what does that mean? It's what it was saying, because it's always in these, these tricky ways, okay? He, it says, rather, the natural clarity, which is not a product of the rational mind, is recognized just as it is. So what it was saying was, there never were chains. We put those chains on us. We put them on with our belief systems. 
we put them on because we forgot who we were. That was what the story was about last time. We forgot who we were. There were never any material chains. And it goes on to say, with an internal grasping mind as the cause and an external fixated object as the condition, you wander constantly in the samsaric world. Samsara is this world of illusion that we wander in. And it says, <clears throat> you can never experience a moment of divorce from the naturally disposed indwelling vision in the now. But because we fail to recognize it, <clears throat> because we forget it is frozen, the natural flow like water frozen into ice. We've frozen it. And that's how we, that's how we believe. And it's really important to try and understand this because I know that in the Torah praises, I was just taking this out so I could show you. In the Torah praises, you know, you do Torah praises and at the end, just looking where, that, where it is, she actually, the very last thing when you say what all the praises are about, not forgetting this, not forgetting that, um, all of those kind of things when you've done it. I just want to see if I can find it quickly. Um, okay. And she and right at the end it says, though it has been eaten or drunk, and what she's talking about is all the poisons of life, though the poisons have been eaten or drunk, its complete elimination will be obtained through remembering, through remembering. So you can eliminate everything through remembering and not forgetting. Isn't it an amazing thing? Because it gives you all these ways of helping yourself and everything. And in the end, it says all of these will be eliminated by one moment of remembering. Quite profound. And also in the Sutra of the Inexhaustible Mind, it says, consciousness passes, primal awareness lasts. One passes, one lasts. And another Sutra says, although in the mundane world everything conceivable may burn, the sky will not perish, nor will intrinsic awareness. It never perishes. When you die and the whole physical body dies and all the consciousness, the, the human consciousness dies, what are you left with? Intrinsic awareness. If you recognize it, re-know it, as I taught in the death and dying teachings, then you are free. So why not recognize it now? Why not? It would short circuit this birth and death that we actually live in all the time. So if I want to just talk to you. What I said last week was that Alzheimer's or dementia is one of the real diseases of our age. And it's really got a lot worse. So I was looking at Toku Pema Riktsal in his book, The Great Secret of the Mind. And he spoke about Alzheimer's and dementia, which, as you know, is a forgetting of this whole life's identities and behavior. And he says, these days, the disease of lost memory, which so many people are suffering from, identified with Alzheimer's disease is increasing. He says, in the past, it affected mostly people more than 60 years of age sometimes even forgetting their names or talking without meaning or react with either excessive joy or sadness to minor issues. Nowadays, he says, from 40 years on, people suffer from memory loss. You know, I talk to a lot of people who say to me, how can you prevent yourself from getting dementia and Alzheimer's? Well, for me, you know, the way to prevent it is actually knowing that nature of mind, because that nature of mind is beyond all this temporary thing. But let's just look at what he says. The main causes, he says, are severe pain, too much useless thinking, 
and so much input that the brain cannot rest. He says too much time on the computer is one reason that the mind fails to rest. Further, people who party a lot, large gatherings or work day and night in business or politics without eating properly or sleeping properly do not rest enough mentally or physically. Thinking all the time about a thousand concerns, they cannot rest. And he says, due to this, blood can't flow properly through the brain and the all-pervading wind, which is one of the winds in our, in our bodies, you know, there are a whole lot of winds that flow through the columns of our bodies, and the all-pervading wind inhibits the subtle movements of the mind, allowing headaches and fever. And sometimes, he says, we feel that the wind gets into our heart and makes us uneasy. He says, these are all symptoms of disease of memory loss. A lot from 60 to 70 years can't perform routine actions and help is needed to survive. Now he says, a computer sometimes freezes from overlap, oh, sorry, overload, and slowly it returns to normal when we delete some program functions. He says, we need to clear our thoughts, our beliefs, our habits through regular meditation. He says the antidote to an absent mind, which is forgetfulness, is awareness or mindfulness. So once you have awareness, it's not likely to happen to you. And a lot of people are really scared. But my own experiences with Alzheimer's is, or dementia are very, very interesting because two of my close family members had had Alzheimer's. And I once told you about my one aunt who was totally out of it. But when I went to visit her, she wasn't here, but when I went in to see her and we spoke, um, what was very, very interesting is she said something about death. She was already old in her 90s. She said something about death. And so without even thinking, I started to talk about death and you know, all kinds of things and how you leave the physical body and everything. And then after about 10 minutes of talking, I said, oh, my dear aunt, I must be really exhausting you. And what she said absolutely lucidly, which was amazing, was she said to me, oh, no, it's exquisite what you're talking about in perfect language. It's exquisite. Tell me more. Now, I found that so fascinating that she did kind of know me. But what I found so fascinating was how, where was she? Where was this mind that could no longer function in this world, but could do it? And also another relative of mine who was a very intellectual and well-qualified man who was quite, quite authoritative became the sweetest man when he got dementia or Alzheimer's. So it's a very interesting thing. But then I had a client who asked me, please, to go and see her mother in a home. And her mother was there. And her mother didn't know anybody, not even her. And her mother was screaming all the time. So when I went to see her, she was, oh, Oh, and then she talked a little bit. Oh, she was crying out like that. So I'm just showing you my examples of people that have it. Now, clearly, what, what must happen is that when SEM, the ordinary mind, dissolves a little bit for people who have got dementia, sometimes that nature of mind can take over so that when you say spiritual things to these people, they can understand because they're using, they're using the nature of mind, which is really a very, very interesting thing. And I think it's something we can all truly think about. But this woman was clearly, and this was something that was not resolved in her mind. And I told her daughter to do a lot of mantras 
and a lot of singing and a lot of soothing and a lot of pacification for her. And um, I, th I think she was probably too far gone by that time. But the point is, what was her state of dementia? Maybe her state was that she was hanging on to some trauma or something in her life that never went away, you know, and eventually it was too much for her. So we've got to really look at this. I think the story of Surya Das, who was a, a guy who became a Buddhist monk, and he went to see his grandmother, who totally lost it. And when he went there, all the relatives said, said to him, do you remember Jeffrey? He's your oldest grandson. He lives in so-and-so. Do you remember this? Do you remember? Because people around, the, around those people get desperate for them to remember everything and to be able to talk. But in actual fact, in actual fact, it's actually, it's actually when we were talking about forgetting last week, it's actually the role must become just too much for the mind and too tired. And the mind doesn't want to remember things anymore. And sometimes with the trauma. So he said, he said, when, he, when they all went out of the room and he was with her, he said, my grandmother didn't care where I came from or remembered my way of life. But while I was there for those grand hours we shared, we were totally together. She knew who I was, not as her beloved grandson with no label or title, but those were the moments together. And it was exquisite. And did it matter whether she knew he was, he was her grandchild or not? Now, these are questions I'm asking you because a lot of people say to me when they're retiring, I'm really, really scared. And what they start doing is filling their whole diary with activities so that their mind doesn't go. But I've got news for you. Rather fill your diary with spiritual, with going into the mind. And in that way, rather keep yourself in touch and alive like that, which is really, really important. So if we've got trauma, it's, it's very important because trauma is not in the nature of mind. It's only, it's only in the human part of the mind that there's trauma. Now, I have different people, some people who want to talk and talk and talk and talk about their trauma until it's dry. And some people who say to me, don't talk about it because I, it's too painful. I don't want to hear about it. Now, what do we think about that? Maybe there's a middle way. Because if people refuse and can't talk about anything, something, because it's too painful, then it's bound to affect them later on or in their lives. It's bound to permeate into the life somehow or another. So it's a very important thing to be able to, with people that have gone through trauma, like I look at these these um, hostages and people who've been killed by terrorists or people who've had rape or people who've had all these sort of things, you know, and other people want them to forget. The only way I think you can forget is to know that there is this part of you that is never affected by trauma. I think that's the only way. And I think that's what we've got to practice, that maybe if there is trauma, that you do deal with it a little bit and you do look at it, but then you notice that the mind should not go back and pick it up every single time, you know, and talk about it again. You have to practice this. Because as James Lowe said, there's no difference between emptiness and appearance. We've not realized that we live in a duality and we always conditioned. And he gives a lovely example. He says, there's an empty parking and you drive your car around to get that empty parking and by the time you get there, someone's gone into the parking. He says, oh, the parking seems to be full. And you go, it is full. I need the parking. 
He says, it seems to be full. He says, well, it's both and it's none. Relatively, it's full. Ultimately, it's empty. So it's both and neither substantial nor unsubstantial. No extremes of the two, both and nothing. Mark, that must sound crazy to you, but you'll get used to it. It's just Buddhist language. It's okay. It's just language that you have to really, really realize. So one little story, and then we'll do a meditation. Um, there was once a renowned scholar monk in China. It's always in China. I wonder what happened to China, who was a teacher and he would go from monastery to monastery, carrying the weighty written sutras, Dharma teachings, his own lectures all on his back. And he was getting, he would get tired. And one day as he was walking up a mountain path, he came upon a tiny tea shack in which an elderly woman sold tea, noodles and rice to pilgrims and travelers. Now this monk had have received many compliments about his knowledge and everything and he become quite haughty. And on this particular day, when he approached the tea shack, he put down all his written manuscripts that contained all his commentaries, and he asked the old woman for some tea. And she said, certainly, but since you are such a learned teacher, before we have tea, we must have a little dharma. And he said, all my dharma is over there, old lady. Can you read, illiterate old lady, he said to her. What good is it if your dharma is over there outside of yourself? She said, what a burden that must be. At that moment, the monk awoke to his arrogance, realizing the truth about himself. And with tears in his eyes, he bowed to the old woman three times saying, I don't need my commentaries anymore. I'm free of that heavy burden. Thank you for pointing directly to the dharma within me. I'll leave them here for you to use as firewood. And the woman said, now we can have our tea. Okay, so I think that's very, very important. So I'd like to look at some unawareness, but maybe somebody wants to ask or comment or about the um, dementia, because <clears throat> it's a very interesting thing because so many people now are really suffering from dementia. It's terrible. So anybody want to say or ask? No. Anybody? Okay, then let's do a little meditation practice. I'm going to do it from on contemplation. So let's do a little of Tukton stuff. So get yourself into a lovely straight position, your spinal column straight, your chin a little bit tucked in, your hands on your lap right over left with the thumbs touching, your eyes open, and just start your beautiful breathing. Breathing in to the great big Dalmata the absolute wisdom, blue sky, open yourself completely and totally. So you're breathing in, remembering, remembering how many lives have I had as a human being? How many times have I been through this? Breathe in the beautiful openness absolutely everything and as you breathe out let go and let be of everything first today all the day's events all the things you've been through today just let them be into the great big empty sky absolutely open so you breathe in to the count of three or four, and you bring out, breathe out to the count of three or four. In and out. Remembering all those beautiful instructions. 
focusing on the breath, focusing on the openness, focusing on the Dharmata, and then breathing out absolutely everything, letting go and letting be of everything in your mind, completely and totally. Now in the Dzogchen, the essential point is the state of contemplation. That's the state of immediate intrinsic awareness. While you are in a state of contemplation, it's a condition inseparable from the view of emptiness. Emptiness means full of possibility, not empty, full of possibility. Everything is just causes and conditions that fall apart the minute you stop fixating and grasping. All of one's thoughts and actions continue as usual without any deliberate calculations. Don't stop anything. Don't analyze anything. Don't fixate on anything. No conceptual elaborations. The state of shamatha is calm abiding, being exactly where you are and allowing absolutely everything to be quiet and peaceful letting the thoughts come and go. Vipassana is the state where we look inside and we see, we recognize. But neither the calm state of shamatha nor the movement of thoughts, vipassana, or rikpa. The thoughts are the power, energy, potentiality and expression of the spontaneous energy of the mind. Ritpa can be discovered in calm abiding or when your mind is moving. It's not the experience itself. It's the immediate awareness of that experience. What does it mean to be aware? It means knowing, watching, Noticing exactly what your mind does. Watch how your mind goes out, picks up a feeling, dissects it, analyzes it, works it out, maybe keeps picking it up. And when we are in this state, we actually consciously allow it to be. just come to a detached observation of the movement of thoughts. And that is the capacity of the nature of mind, an unlimited capacity. Whatever is there, it does not matter. You just allow it to be. And we come to live in the nature of that pure mind, which just allows things to process as they need to, without touching, without picking up, just being observer. And when we relax, we recognize the thoughts and passions as just being the creative play of the mind. We don't suppress them. We don't interfere with them. We don't get distracted by them. We don't follow them. We just recognize them to be the continuous display of the inherent creative energy of your primal awareness. That is the state of contemplation.
whatever arises, because you have that intrinsic awareness, it clears it into the sky, into the Dharmata, back into the essence. It never was substantial. It never has been substantial. And now we just allow it to dissolve back. There's only one antidote to all your pain, all your suffering, all your thoughts, all your feelings. And that is awareness. And this antidote is like a panacea that cures all ills. contemplation, the internal awareness and the external appearance encounter each other and become integrated. If you don't integrate them, then it becomes subject, which is you, object, which is the feeling. You just allow them to encounter each other and dissolve. That is the state of contemplation. Bring it back to the breath each time. And have that complete intrinsic awareness. Practice it. Start off by focus, notice, return. Focus, notice, return. And get your mind trained. Do it every time you're waiting. Ten times a day, during the day, one minute, two minutes, whatever time you've got. Even when you're not waiting, when you're just busy at work. Just stop. Tupton says when he's at the airport, he just stands still for a minute in the queue and becomes mindful, becomes aware. And that's how you practice. And you do it all the time, wherever you are, whatever experience you're going. That's how you get to that nature of mind. There's no other way. And I'm going to do the comparison of your ordinary human mind and your nature of mind. But I first want to just look at unawareness. Does anyone want to comment or question? You're all quiet as anything tonight. Anyone? You just want to listen to me? Okay. I don't mind, but you know, it's nice when you ask or you say. You're all so quiet tonight. Come on, Marion, I'm waiting for you. <laughs> what do you want to say? Um, Geshla would always um, tell me that when you feel irritated or you feel like you've got to, you know, you get that, like like ST was saying, how do you deal with that that's emotion in the moment? Um, he would always say that it's like you use it as your, your patient's practice. So it's an antidote to the actual emotion that's happening. And, and patients... Um, it it uh, it eradicates all those. The, it's like the antidote. So it will take out your negative emotion. Like uh, compassion is antidote to to um, anger. yeah. So you use the antidote to help the negative emotion disappear, and um, then you can see the emptiness of it as well. And it helped you, and that thing is actually helping you. Yeah. So <laughs> so something so that. No, that's, that's brilliant, and it is, and sometimes we need that antidote. Look, ultimately, we don't even want to have an antidote, okay? Ultimately, 
We don't want to have an antidote. We just want to understand that's the content. This is the cup. So let's look at the cup. This is the mm -hmm. mirror. That's the reflection. But I absolutely agree with you because people find it almost impossible, you know, to really, really. Yeah. Really so when you feel irritated in the moment. Yeah. Mm. I think it's really yeah. important to say. So you can use an antidote. But I mean, in contemplation, you, you want more than an antidote. Ev, did you want to say something? Nice to see you. Yeah. No, you don't want to say. Okay. Well, we're glad that you're there. <laughs> okay. You don't want to say anything. I thought that's why you switched on your camera. Okay, well, let's just look at them for everybody very, very quickly. The three kinds of unawareness. Now, I'll tell you why I'm looking at the three kinds of unawareness. Because you can't get wisdom if you don't know what unawareness is. Do you all understand? So if you don't understand what the opposite of awareness is, which is unawareness or forgetfulness, if you don't understand that, you can't get wisdom. So Anand Tupton, he gives three kinds of unawareness. Unawareness in, in Tibetan is ma rikpa sum. Okay. What the unaware, unawareness gives rise to samsara. Samsara is the wheel of life that goes round and round and round and round. Okay. So he gives three kinds of unawareness, which I want to do very quickly. The one is called causal unawareness of a single identity. Now that's quite a big mouthful. But what it is, is the genesis, the basis of all unawareness, that inside your true nature, there's the potential to either know or not know, to be deluded or be wise, either or. And the first kind of causal unawareness is that it exists. It's right there, the causal unawareness. So it's up to you. If you decide that you're going to change direction and you're going to watch the deluded mind and change it, then you're going to come back to going in the direction of wisdom. You have to decide that the first kind of unawareness is that the potential is right there in the essence. You can either go the wise way or the deluded way. It's up to you. It depends how much you're going to attach to the solidity of everything you're going to go through. Or if you're going to stand back and say, this is just another experience in my life. This is just one of the things I need to go through. This is one of the things the mirror of my mind created. And it's not tangible. And I'm not going to suffer from it because I know what it is. But the first kind of unawareness is that part that is really, really, really in, in the, the essence that you can go either way. That's called the causal unawareness, okay? The potential to be deluded. Now, remember, it's up to you. The second kind of is called co-emergent awareness. That means the inborn unawareness. But what happens here is, here is the essence. The essence is called the or the ground, okay? Now, as something comes out of the ground, if you don't recognize it to be your own display, if you think it's something over there, something bad that is happening to me, that is called co-emergent unawareness. That when the essence creates whatever it is, if it's something you like, something you don't like, that's irrelevant. But it's your own display. And if you don't recognize it as your own display, then you are deluded, you are unaware. So you start saying, I hate this. I wish this would go away instead of saying, hang on, 
this reflection. It's perfect for me. This is exactly what I need. I'm in the right place at the right time. This is what I need. If we go the unawareness, we don't know. This angry, horrible person who's doing horrible things to me. You know, Tupton was talking, not Tupton, um, James Lowe was talking and he said, he was talking about when the Chinese arrested all the, the Tibetan monks when they came to Tibet, they arrested them. Now these poor monks were, um, these poor monks were ardent practitioners. Some of them had been in caves for years. They were rounded up. And many of them still thought they had their mala beads with them. So when they were in prison, they would go like this, even though they didn't have the beads, they would go like this with their thumb. So they said the Chinese cut off their thumbs of anybody that did that. You know, I was so horrified. Now how, if you're just doing your practice, how, you haven't got beads, you're just doing it in your head, how would you react if someone cut off your thumb? I mean, you'd hate them. You'd, you'd, you'd call them the cruelest thing. But you know what? The whole of the Tibetan history, Guru Rinpoche said, you created these causes and conditions that are going to come upon you. Somehow, we can't remember. But when you remember that, you realize that whatever is displaying is your own creation. It's a difficult thing to understand. And so the enlightened people know, even with the thumb getting cut off, that it, that it is their own creation. And in that way, they can go to the nature of mind, which then doesn't get caught in the blood and the gore of the thumb being cut off. It's, it's unbelievable because I've watched how they get tortured and they never, ever... They never, ever, ever do anything. They, they accept completely where they are and they just carry on. So the first kind of unawareness is that dormant unawareness. The second kind is when something is created and we don't know that it's our own creation, that's the co-emergent unawareness. And the third type of aware, unawareness is very interesting because it's called the unawareness of labeling. So not only does consciousness not recognize the whole experience of reality as its own display, but it begins to label everything and, and misperceive that everything is outside of itself. It says, here I am, and I'm in a trap of hope, of fear, of aversion, of attraction. You believe the stories and everything that are in your mind, okay, and you label them. This is a terrible thing that happened to me. This is a wonderful thing that happened to me. This is a good thing. This is a bad thing. You are a wicked person and you are a lovely person. The labeling is all only our own belief system. It's called unawareness. We can't see. The Buddha could see everything. So he knew what it all was. And these three unawarenesses are the root of samsara. Our minds, he says, so often make up stories and we believe them. Like, I'm so useless at everything. This is too terrible. I don't know why I haven't got money. I don't know why this has happened to me. I don't know why I'm married to this terrible person. I don't know why my husband's putting his hand down like that. Okay? I don't know why this. I don't know why that. You know, I mean, it's all these stories. They're deluded stories. They're unawareness. We are in the right place at the right time. Argue with me if you don't believe me. I'm giving you the traps that we fall in all the time of the three unawarenesses. So how do we get to intrinsic awareness? And next time we'll do the, the differentiation between 
that and um, the same, the ordinary mind and the and the um, and the uh, uh, really nature of mind. But I don't want to do that now. I want to just look at some of the ways that we can get to intrinsic awareness. Does anybody want to say anything or ask anything? Are you just absorbing it and nobody's challenging it and nobody's saying anything about it? You're just fine. No, it's because it, it's it's the absolute truth, Mel, but it's like, it's a, um, it's a hole that we keep falling into. And I mean, I can see it. I mean, um, the other day I baked some oats, you know, because I'm trying to make myself some, some healthy snakes, snacks. And I burnt the nuts, and then I, I find myself saying, I can't do anything right. <laughs> and then I caught myself saying that, and Breville also said, I hate it when you say that. And then I said, I can't believe I fell in the trap of saying that to, uh, to myself, you know. I just and burnt how, the nuts. And how many times do we say, I can't believe I did that. I yeah. can't I said that, I put my foot into it, I can't believe this happened, or that happened, or the other happened, we've just got our belief systems about everything we have to change this, we have to remember we have to stop forgetting our real true nature, our real true nature is not affected by any of these things how do we get there? Awareness Awareness, but let's talk about some of the ways of getting there, and then we'll do the, this comparison later. Okay, first of all, with the meditation, shamata, focus, notice, return. Then the second one is vipassana. Now, you can do vipassana in a lot of different ways. You can look at the mind, you can say, what is the mind? Does it have a shape? Does it have a color? Does it have a... Bill? I never really... I, I did that a lot, but I never really found it um, so amazing. But true Vipassana is when you have that moment, like I was talking about in the beginning, where you just suddenly realize, you know, you just... You, you, you're in the depths of despair, but you just have a moment of an optimistic understanding of what you're going through. And I'm sure all of you have had that experience sometime or another, when you're really going through a really hard time and you, you suddenly have that insight, you're looking and you suddenly see the truth of what I've been talking about. That's the real Vipassana. That's the real way of knowing who you are. So doing a lot of looking is very, very important with the meditation. But one of the other ways to really get to awareness, and I've done a lot of teaching on the wheel of life. Mark, go back and get that teaching on the wheel of life because it's really important. Because what is the wheel of life? The wheel of life shows you that everything in our ordinary, humane mundane lives is just causes and effects, causes and effects, causes and effects. But the good news, so if you look at the wheel of life, it starts off with ignorance, that's your unawareness, which is your potential, plus the next link is volitional activity, what you choose to do with your life. So your ignorance plus your volitional activity leads to the birth of this life. So take a long, hard look in the mirror. And if you don't like what you see in the mirror, know that it was caused by ignorance and your volitional activity, what you did, how you conducted yourself brought you to the next link, which is called name and form, and all the things that we have. Why are some people blind? Why do some people see? Why are some people have money? Why do some people not? Why are some people really conscious and other people aren't? 
from the ignorance and your volitional action comes all the next links of your name and who you are and which parents you get and all of that. All of that comes on. And then on the wheel of life comes the next thing, how you feel about it. So mostly, if we've got what we consider good things, then we feel great. I've got a great life. I'm gorgeous. I've got a wonderful job. I've got a wonderful career. Everything's cool. So we feel well. Other people come to me, nothing ever worked out in my life. I really can't stand it. I've never got any money for everything. I'm so ugly. I'm so fat. Nobody likes me. I'm just giving you any hyperbole to wake you up a bit. Okay. So when we've got all that, who to blame? Your parents. Don't be crazy. You can't blame your parents. Your ignorance and volitional action catapulted you because you never worked it out into these parents. They catapulted you into a situation which would evoke your own creation. So it's not their fault. It's your fault. You take responsibility for it. So then we come to the feelings, the cravings, and then the grasping, the fixating, holding on to everything. This is mine, don't touch it. These are my children. This is my house. This is my everything. That's, that's how it goes. Now, what it tells you on the wheel of life is, if when you come to the feeling part of the link, you change your mind, and you say, you know what? Hang on. I take responsibility for this. I'm going to change. I'm going to do what I need to do. Then you can already not come to the grasping part. You just start letting go as we've been talking about now. Okay? Because after all of that, so in other words, previous life to this life, to how we feel and grasp about it, to the next life, to old age, sickness, death, all the horrible suffering that we have, back to the wheel of life. So when we look at this, which is called dependent origination, we can get off that wheel of life. How? By remembering. By remembering who we truly are by taking real care to remember but hang on this is just a temporary drama who I really am is something completely different and I need to take that I need look Kathy's changed her identity I'm just looking at her little thing at the top there <laughs> Oh, God, she's a character there. Look, look at her in the corner there. <laughs> she's changed her whole identity. You can do that too. You can become, I don't know what his name is, but you can all do that. Oh, my God, that is so funny. You can do it tomorrow morning if you want, okay? she's just changed her whole identity and can I have a mask too I'm going to change mine too but just think about it when you understand dependent origination when you understand how the wheel of life works you can develop I love that Kati you can develop complete and total awareness and change and get off the wheel of life and stop going back all the time. If you only just got it now, Kay, or you, you still laughing. She's laughing at you. It's so cute. She's, anyhow, she's gone to the beach now. It's wonderful. <laughs> it's marvelous. Just keep doing it because you're really illustrating everything that I'm doing. It's hysterical. So do you all understand, okay? We've got to stop the grasping. We've got to loosen the grip, which is really, really important. And that's another way of developing awareness. And then 
just very briefly, and we can do it some more next week, the various Buddhist practices. Now, a lot of people say to me, I don't like the practices. I don't want to do them in Tibetan. I don't understand the Tibetan. That's fine. Do them in English. The English is going to have a momentum like nobody's business. But always remember that the Buddha taught these practices I give you from beginning to advance. These practices I give you are only the raft to cross the river. Once you get across the river, you don't need the practices. Okay. But Without the practices, it's almost impossible to cross the river. Why? It's not impossible. Because of our habit conditioning. Do you all understand? Because of our conditioning, it's really very, very hard to get across the river. So the practices, when you do them on a regular basis, the practices help you to cross the river. So if we just look at a couple of these practices, the first two, if you look at the preliminary practice, are refuge and bodhicitta. Now let's just let's not talk about the actual practice. Let's just talk about what does it mean, refuge and bodhicitta? Well, I'll tell you what it means. Refuge is because this whole world is in an insecure state. Okay. When you look at people. All we do in South Africa is we put more, more, um, uh, you know, more, more, what's the word I'm looking for? I've got too many words in my mouth. We put more security onto our houses. We put more guards, more things on the fences, like, you know, like prisons and everything else. Everybody is even insecure wherever they are, not only in South Africa. Now, the refuge, if you take out a refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, that's fine, but that's not the real refuge. The real refuge is taking refuge in your three kayas, your Dharmakaya, which is your essence, your Sambhokakaya, which is the expression, and your Nyamanakaya, which becomes like a wish-fulfilling wheel or a wish-fulfilling jewel, which I talked about last week, wherever you go. And that's what the refuge is. And when you do it with real heart, you know what I do in the morning when I take refuge is, I put all the people that, are, that I've had in the previous days that are going through a terrible time, and I put them there with me, and I take the refuge for them. I take the refuge for them, and it's really, really, really important. And bodhicitta, you can do bodhicitta in any way, because all bodhicitta means is, I'm taking refuge on behalf of all sentient beings. Now, I took this little poem, which I'm going to read you, we're going to finish very soon. I took this little poem from... Um, <laughs> Oh, Kelly, I love it. It's such a good example. You can be a piggy. You can be a you can be on the beach. You can be a little anything. It's wonderful. She's changed. It's too gorgeous for words, Kathy. We love it. Absolutely. It's hilarious. Um, what I want to say to all of you is that this poem says it all that Shanti Deva said. And this is what we're doing with Bodhicitta. He goes like this. He says, when you make your aspiration, this is how it should be, something like this. And you can make up your own poem, you write poem. May I be a god for those who are protectorless, a guide for those who journey on the road, for those who wish to cross the water. May I be a boat, a raft, a bridge, May I be an isle for those who yearn for land, a lamp for those who long for light, for all who need a resting place, may I be a bed, for those who need a servant, may I be their slave, may I be the wishing jewel, the vase of wealth, a word of power and the supreme healing, 
May I be the tree of miracles for every being, the abundant cow, just like the earth and space itself and all the other mighty elements for boundless multitudes of being. May I always be the ground of life, the source of varied sustenance. Thus, for everything that lives as far as are the limits of the sky, may I constantly, may I be constantly their source of livelihood until they pass beyond all sorrow. Now, that's such a beautiful poem that Shanti Deva gave, but you can make up your own. You can just, when you take refuge, you can even just say simply, I take refuge in my nature of mind and how it expresses itself. May I always be all sorts of things. Whatever pain I have, may I take the pain of others. Whatever gifts I have, may I share them with others. You can make your own up. That's refuge and bodhicitta. But the fact that you do them, she's gone to a party now. The fact that you do them, the fact that you that you have that thought makes a huge, huge difference to returning to that nature of mind. It's very, very important. And when you do these practices and when you do purification practices, you close the gap of duality. Because the gap of duality is always, I'm here and you there. I was laughing at my husband because every time he goes up the steep Monroe Drive, he sees these guys with their, with their recycling trolleys, you know, and they're walking up this huge, huge, huge hill. And he says every time he sees one of them, he gets absolutely heart sore. So he just stops on the middle of the hill. I mean, you could have an accident and gives them some money, you know, and says, please do your job or whatever. So today he says he walked up, to, he drove up to the top of the hill. And guess what? There were a whole crowd of them with their trolleys. They'd all gathered together because all of them have seen him giving individual. I said, how many 20 rands did you give? He says, I don't know. I just gave them all out of my wallet, whatever I had, because they all gathered. They heard the story of this person who comes up the hill and who really feels sorry for them, pushing the trolley up the hill, you know. So these things happen. They happen to all of us. Wherever, once you take that Bodhi Chitta, once you do the purification exercises, and if you don't know how to do them, I'll help you with pleasure to do those purification um, prayers. But once you do them, you become this open, this open, what can I say, wish-fulfilling wheel. Sorry, my tree behind or cultivation. What are we saying, Dami, Damika? Um or cultivation of a mind of unconditional love and benevolence for all sandhi means constitute an important spiritual practice in Buddhism, which ultimately culminates in identification of oneself with all beings. Beautiful. And it's really... Mel, cool. Mel sorry. No, please. The, the poem just you read a few minutes ago. So this Maitri Bhavana is in... Theravada Buddhism. Sorry, my voice is still groggy. <laughs> anyway, um, so a lot of Buddhists, they meditate this every single night and in the morning as a little, yeah, meditation. So it's called my Tripavana in singular. Beautiful. Because where she comes from, Originally, you know, they do the Theravada Buddhism and it's and it's very, very beautiful. It's very important because what happens to you afterwards is wherever you go, shopping, wherever, somebody will find you once you make that aspiration. So next week, I want to go to the looking at the difference between Sem and Semni, between the ordinary human mind, and that really helps us. And I want to finish just some of the practices we can do. And I want to finish with them. And Kathy, 
I love it. Your, your different roles are marvelous, wonderful, great. And they show us you could do it on the computer, you could do it in life, you could do it wherever you are. I love it. I wish I knew how to do it. You'll teach me one day, okay? <laughs> it's too gorgeous. So let's dedicate. And I want you to think carefully about these and then we'll finish next week. We'll look at some of the deeper practices and what they mean and why they bring you to the nature of mind. So today, I'm just going to use my own English part for the final dedication. We dedicate and share the merit of this teaching, whatever was here that was worthwhile, for all sentient beings that are going through wars, for all sentient beings who are going through terrible things, for the hostages, for the people in capture, for the people in Russia that have been, that have been in prison for no reason, for all the people we dedicate all this teaching, may they be able to actually see the temp temporary transient nature of whatever drama they are going through. It's exactly like Kathy's different variety of things. We can be anything we want. It all comes out of the beautiful nature of mind. And may we dedicate to all those people. Sonam die tamche zipane topne nepe dranam tamche ne jega naji balak topaye sipe sole doa dro warsho. So if anybody, I'm just going to stop the